Let's go to work talking Big 12 football. A very interesting meltdown. Uh, on the old tweet machine yesterday, I don't understand this about Big 12 football fans. And if somebody wants to educate me, please, I, I, am, I am open to it. Why are Big 12 football fans so thin-skinned? Kyle Whittingham, as you are aware, um, went on 365 Sports at Big 12 Media Day, then talked to a guy with a lack of journalistic integrity up in the great Northwest <laughs> this week, and said the, the exact same thing that he said at Big 12 Media Day, which was significant realignment is coming to college football, and it is going to be the NFL model. And once he said that, immediately Big 12 fans melted down and said, well, we don't want you here anyway. <laughs> Thinking that Kyle Whittingham somehow disrespected, insulted, went after, took a shot at the Big 12. And I don't understand that line of thinking because that's not at all what happened. Kyle Whittingham in no way, shape, or form disrespected the Big 12 with that comment. What Kyle Whittingham said was, hey, major change is coming and the Super League is on the way. Is that four years? Is that a month? Is that 10 years? I don't know, but it's coming. That's essentially in a nutshell with Kyle Whitting what Kyle Whittingham said. I don't believe in any way, shape, or form that Kyle Whittingham insulted, took a shot at, took a veiled shot at, somehow under the table. None of that happened. Kyle Whittingham wasn't talking about the Big 12. He was talking about college football. And if you know Kyle Whittingham, he's not a guy that sends messages. He speaks very plainly. He's one of the guys that actually, I know this is crazy, he's one of the college football coaches that you can believe it when he says it. And when Kyle Whittingham says that significant realignment is on the way and the NFL model is to follow, I don't know why that is shocking. And I certainly don't understand why that's a shot at the Big 12. Because as we have told you on this show, we've been told many, many times that when the Super League arrives in college football, it will be the NFL model. It will be the, hey, did you win enough games to get in the playoff? Cool, you're in. Oh, you didn't? You're out. That's what it's going to be. You're going to have two divisions with, with two conferences, with multiple divisions. Like, it is going to be the NFL model. Now, does that mean that the Big 12 or any other conference is going away? Certainly not. Because we are not in a place in this country in college athletics where we are ready to compromise the revenue stream that is college basketball. College basketball anchors the conference model. Stick and ball sports, track and field. If we learned anything out of these Olympics in Paris, it was that track and field is a behemoth in this country, and it's not going anywhere at the college level. All of that to say, the college conference system, the Big 12, the Big 10, the SEC, the G5, that model isn't going anywhere. And Jake, I don't believe that that's what Kyle Whittingham said. No, I, and, I, and I, I really don't understand why people think this was a shot at the Big 12. I mean, Kyle Whittingham is just simply talking about the health of college football in the bigger picture and essentially the direction of the sport. And he has a lot of strong thoughts on that. And I think that Kyle Whittingham... You know, pretty much, pretty much articulated in a very sensible and responsible way where the where he feels the sport is going. So it's not as though he said, you know, hey, this is going to happen, and then the Big Twelve is getting left out of that, or hey, you know, at Utah, you know, we need to get to the Big Ten because the Super League's coming, and that's going to, you know, the Big Twelve is not going to be in a good spot. He didn't say any of that, and. It really, it, it was surprising to me that people were so like, just outraged. Like, like Big Twelve fan was so upset with this, and and I, I, I'm with you. I didn't really understand it. I, I, I don't understand how you, you hear what he said at Big Twelve Media Day. You, you know, you see this, the comments in this interview, and you're like, yeah, wow, he took a shot at the Big Twelve. Where do you get that from? And 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 the thing is i feel like kyle's been pretty consistent on his message you know it's it it really hasn't changed that much he's just simply saying hey we're heading towards an nfl model there's going to be realignment as part of that and and frankly he's saying what we he's saying what's going to happen is what we all want which is a model where human beings and computers don't decide the fate of football teams when it comes to the playoffs. So I, 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 yeah, I don't understand why people were so upset with this. This is what Kyle Whittingham said to uh, the guy that has no journalistic integrity uh, right here. I don't think that that is, that is that much of a stretch. 
I don't believe that it is something where you have to get all upset. And again, I'll just take you back to, um, you know, what Kyle Whittingham said on 365 Sports at Big 12 Media Day. So much change already, and there's more on the horizon, I can tell you that. We're not done. Uh, I think it's ultimately going to get to two super conferences and and uh, their own playoff system and and uh, probably break away from the NC2A and do, you know, have a commissioner mm-hmm. and all. An NFL minor league model, I think, is where we're heading in that regard. It's not complicated. Why is that shocking? Why is that a shot at the Big 12? It's not. And I understand why Big 12 fans are a little sensitive. Big 12 fans have taken a beating, the truck stop conference, your mom's a lot lizard. Like, I understand all of that. We've heard probably that was a little too far. But my point is, I understand why Big 12 fans are a little sensitive about about things like Kyle Whittingham saying college football is going to a Super League in an NFL model. I don't believe that's a shot at the Big 12. And I think we need to stop being so damn soft in this country when it comes to sports takes. We 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 tend to light ourselves on fire about Paul Feinbaum, uh, Kyle Whittingham speaking truth about the future of college football. Relax. That doesn't mean the Big 12 is less than. It doesn't mean the Big 12 is going anywhere. What it means is the financial model is different. And I I... I go back to Syracuse fan. I go back to UConn fan saying that their football program is well-funded. It's not well-funded. You're not, like we said the other day, I don't believe in any way, shape, or form that 99.9% of G5 schools can afford to play in a Super League where it's hundreds of millions of dollars in football uh, cost. Now, it's also a lot more money coming in but it's a lot of money going out. Yeah. We're talking about the, the, you know, NIL settlements where there's a new lawsuit going to court. We're talking about, um, you know, the cost of paying players. We're talking about the cost of adding institutional infrastructure. Like all this stuff is really expensive. There's a huge chunk of coin that comes out of your pocket. I, I talked about San Diego State. Surprisingly, most San Diego State fans agree with me that San Diego State probably is not in a financial position to afford to go to a Super League model. Not with where the economics of the, the Cal State system and education in the state of California and really where cost models in the state of California are right now. San Diego State is probably not in that position. It's really close and you have to wonder if Cal Berkeley in in to a lesser extent, UCLA are in a position to to go to a Super League, let alone San Diego State. And I think that's what's difficult. And I, and I, and I think that, you know, again, the, to be clear, I, most of the Big 12 would be would be easily in. I, I mean, I do think when you All look at the All of the Big 12. I, well, I think that the, the some of these Big 12 schools that are not doing a whole lot in football – financially would struggle to make the super league work. I mean, you're you're you can fund your football program right now, but if you're not getting, you know, if you're not getting your own shares in the college football playoff, if you're not generating those shares, you're 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 counting on other people to to bring in enough revenue for you to continue to survive. So if a super league happens, you know, I, I, yeah, I'm sure you'd be in it, but I, I just have some questions about how that's going to work, especially when we think about, you know, Brett Yormark hinting at the fact that you know, it's going to be a, a, a pay based on performance model moving forward. But I think 12. that's what everybody is should be going to. And most, I think most of these four leagues are. I, I mean, the ACC is there already. I think you look at the the Big Twelve. There's no question that's coming. You you we're no longer in a place where you can subsidize again. You UConn football. You're not subsidizing UConn football, who does not have an on campus stadium. Why is why is UCF in and USF is out? Because USF doesn't have an on-campus football stadium yet, right? It it's basic common sense dollars and cents. That's the difference between again, Syracuse. Syracuse is is not in a place where they're generating enough revenue. They're not in a place now where they can even compete to get to a college football playoff. Syracuse is in no way, shape, or form prepared to spend a hundred million dollars a year on college football. You're just not there. You're not that you are, you are not there. UConn is UConn going to spend a hundred million dollars a year on college football. No. And that, that for my money, 
that is what it's going to cost. For, in my opinion, based on people I've spoken to, it's $100 million a year. And it's not just, well, money. I understand inflation, but pads aren't that expensive. Uh, it's not just the, uh, even, even just athletic budget is not what the biggest issue is. The biggest issue is, think. have you thought about the insurance cost of having more kids on scholarship? Have you thought about the institutional educational cost and infrastructure of having more kids on scholarship? That alone is tens of millions of dollars. You don't just say, well, you know, because uh, you gave Kevin a uh, scholarship, that's just free. The, the institution doesn't pay for that. The hell they don't. Yeah, they do. Yes, they do. So I I think there is a, the haves and the have nots will become exponentially more clear. Like, and I think the separation is going to be immediate. Yeah. Moses is going to walk down center street and part the, part the Red Sea in college football. Yes. And when we talk about all oh, the G fives getting left behind, you better ask them if they want to go with. Yeah, well, that's that's part of it too. I mean, I don't even think most G fives want to go with. I I I think what most G fives want is just a playoff for schools at their level. That that's all, right? I mean, if, if the money the money's going to be lower because you're operating in a a smaller pool of money, but again, it's all percentages, right? I mean, again, if you know your let's just say your average G five operates at fifty million a year, whatever the number is, I mean, you're 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 still able to make money on that, but you shouldn't be competing on the same football field as schools that are spending, you know, 100, 150. You know, you had a, when we looked at it, Ohio State was at like 180 or whatever number, like crazy number. So it's like, it just, it's just not a fair. Why does Gonzaga not have football? Yeah, right. I mean, that's just a profitability choice. That's them saying, hey, you know what? We're we're going to put all our all our resources um, into basketball. And, and obviously they have other sports, but. That's that's the strategy there. And and again, that's where I think, you know, Gonzaga is a good example of, you know, obviously they're not just going to randomly add football to try to get into a Super League. But y if you're Gonzaga sitting here, uh, you can't tell me you're not looking at the economics of this and understanding it in totality. So you you can see where sports are going. I, I think you have to have some ability to keep in it real. And I just think Big 12 fans do not. Kyle Whittingham's a hell of a coach, but I think it is an indictment on this league that fans are so sensitive. Look at the upheaval a couple of weeks ago when we were we were talking about the fact that this this league doesn't have a blue blood brand in football. Right. I didn't even think that was controversial or up for discussion. Does the Big 12 have a blue blood brand in football? They don't. They don't. It, Austin ain't in this league anymore. Right. Norman's not in this league anymore. But it, I, those were your, those were your blue bloods. All of your, your blue bloods are in the Big Ten and the SEC now. Nebraska ain't walking. To, uh, Nebraska ain't coming through that door anytime soon, Marty. Yeah. Right. Like you look at these. You look at where the Big Twelve is. I think Brett Yormark is the guy you should be. Thanking, because I think Brett Yormark put the Big 12 in a position to compete financially. Because if if you'd have kept doing the same thing you'd always been doing, you'd have got the same result. And I don't think you'd be here today. And I think, frankly, if the if the Pac-12 wasn't such a disaster, you wouldn't be here today. If Brett Yormark had gotten the job that that George Klyovkov got, you, the Big 12 wouldn't be here today. It's as simple as that. The envelope calculations. I, I, I mean, I, so to go to go full circle, you survive that. You did get Brett Yormark. I think you have to be incredibly thrilled about where you sit in college football without a blue blood brand. Yeah, absolutely. And I think that you know that's where that's where we always talk about. You know, the Big Twelve needs to have some of these other schools that don't get talked about as much win some football games this year. I mean, I. I, I uh, I, again, I'll believe it when I see it, but yeah. you know, schools like Tech have to start winning. You know, Baylor's got to start giving a damn. You know, like it, 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 it's not that, you know, TCU hasn't won recently because they have, but TCU's another school where if they can put out a winning season that really bolsters the Big 12 position 
uh, the Big 12's position as far as the playoff is concerned because obviously it's going to help other schools' resumes when we get to the end of the year. Yeah. And and you're sitting here saying, okay, well, hey, the ACC is going to get one school in. You know, the Big and the SEC are getting four. What's the Big 12 doing? You know, what, what you know are, are they able to get two in? Uh, or or what's it look like? Well, all I'm saying is that I think you are in a really good position to survive the next two to four years before the Super League arrives. Because I think that's the time frame. And everybody talking about how, um, you know, it's not going to happen because TV networks that I, I think Feinbaum or somebody was saying you better talk to CBS. Do you really think that CBS... Fox, NBC, ESPN, you really think they're going to say no? Why would they say no? Yeah, I love this assertion that that people are saying, oh, well, you know, they better tear up those current contracts. Yeah, that's absolutely what they're going to do. They're going to rewrite contracts with everybody because everybody through that process is going to make more money. Yeah. So it's like I always say, if 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 just one side has an incentive to do something, it's not going to get done. But if both sides in the conversation have the incentive to get something done, it will get done. And that's why I'm saying I, I feel like it's taboo right now to say, hey, yeah, cool. We've got current contracts in place and there's, you know, all these agreements in place. Those are out the window as soon as the Super League is is actually in a real world getting set up and pushed forward. Yeah, and I think ESPN, who, as many of you are aware, just signed an extension on the college football playoff. They have the most money invested here. They have the most, they have the most skin in the game. They, and they would absolutely, from what I understand, ESPN would absolutely do a college football super league. There's no reason that, like, take CBS. CBS just got out of the SEC deal. Fox just got into the Big Ten deal. Right. Do you think Fox is going to stand in the way? Do you think NBC, who just got into the Big Ten deal and has Notre Dame, is going to stand in the way of what's best for Notre Dame and what's best for the Big Ten? No, they're not going to do that because they're going to make more money. Yeah, because what's best for the, for the conferences is best for the networks. <laughs> but think about it this way. What if you go to a Super League, where does fan interest go? The minute a Super League's announced, where does fan interest go? Oh, it just plummets through. No, it does not. It goes way up. It goes way up. And I know that again, and I'm not disrespecting fans of the G5 and the pro rata you've all deserved in the G5 where you'll have your own playoff and TV contract. Yeah. Because you're, you're he, again, I think. I am fond of saying you have to understand who you are and where you are, and you're not in the Super League, and nor do you want to be. Well, and I think the point you've made over the last couple of months about like this concept of you know the networks and and college football working together to create a system with the NFL where hey we've got the minor league model of playing college football, but then we're going to create this weekend where you've got the national championship, you've got the Super Bowl, like basically more um, you know more collaboration with the NFL. To, to make it make more financial sense for everyone yes. involved. Because the NFL obviously wants college football to continue to do well. You want college football to continue to thrive because obviously college football is what makes the NFL better. We're, we're going to talk a bunch of NFL later in the show about all these different, you know, injuries and rookies and all these situations that all were sprouted in college football. So fans are excited or more excited about college football due to a super league. And then you can, you can build that momentum into an NFL game. That's good for everybody. That's why I'm saying like the assertion that they wouldn't tear up contracts and they wouldn't make change. Dude, they're already talking about new contracts. They're already talking about a new format and how they're going to put it all together. And, and that's what I think people don't realize. Like, it's not that it's going to take five years to put a Super League model together. There's already a rough structure for what the Super Model or the Super League is going to look like. It's how does all the money work? How do we how do we make it work for everybody? How do we get people to understand that they're not going to get the most money or the money they think they should get? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> exactly. And I think that's going to be the most difficult part of this. The TV networks are not going to fight about, hey, we've got to do a new deal. I think they will happily do a new deal because it means more money for them. I mean, so, look, at, look at the matchups that we're getting 
this season that we've talked about so much. I mean, it's all over social media. I, I, I Like, I opened TikTok the other day, and I get, like, five videos from five different accounts about, hey, we've got, you know, this, this Ohio State and Oregon game, and we've got this game and that game, and, hey, by the way, this week in October is, like, the mecca of college football. We've got, like, eight games that are, you know, national championship caliber kind of games. This is amazing. It, we're, we're just talking about single game matchups. We're not even talking about the Super League yet, and people are all, you know, excited and, and and just, you know, can't wait for this to happen. So that's what I'm saying. I, I, I think you can't, you, you can't undersell how I- I excited fans would be for these big games, which is why I keep saying, why do you think the, the ESPN picked up the SEC? They know where things are going. They want to be positioned correctly when it's time to make the move. So, you know, I just think it's inevitable. It's going to happen. It's just a matter of time. So when Whittingham's out here talking about it, again, Big 12 fan, I I actually don't understand why you think this is a shot at the Big 12. This is Kyle Whittingham telling you what we've been telling you for months. Like, it is. (laughs) So it's not new. We'll see. Uh, Bill G, first one in today. By the way, if you uh, donate, chip, give us a super sticker. Um, paid comments are always read first on the show, unless they're by Oak state James, who then will bitch that is commenting, get read. And eventually I'll get there. Uh, I didn't see, uh, I didn't see Whittingham's comments as a shot at the big 12. Uh, neither did I, Yeah, but so many people did. So many people did take them as that, which is remarkable to me. Tanner Plumere, uh, why are big 12 fans thin skin towards Utah? Well, because Nick Sirianni is still a terrible head coach of the Eagles. All right, let's move on. Um, <laughs> in their minds, they're still pissed at Utah fans for acting like jackasses when the Utes join the Big 12. So anything regarding Utah, they get pissed easily. Okay, okay. BYU yeah, fan, I take it easy. Say, come on, bro. Take it easy. You're about to have Jerry Bohannon as your starting quarterback. I wouldn't get excited. You fucking donkey. Utah fan, Jim. <laughs> Big 12 fans don't want him because they can already feel the ass whooping. I would probably agree with that. I would probably agree with that. Sharice, uh, arm. Wow. Sharice, are you wow. up a little early this morning? Uh, Sharice Armistead. I think Utah can, could make a run in the big 12 this year because of Kyle Whittingham. They're going to be good. They are. The guy recruits, he coaches the hell out of his players and they have their star players are healthy. Proof's in the pudding. I mean, it is, to me, it is, in my opinion, I think Kyle Whittingham is a top five coach in the country. I think Kyle Whittingham's ability to to delegate to his staff, um, his one weak spot is Achilles heel has always been the quarterback. And his lack of a, his lack of, of an elite quarterback, I think has hurt his ability to recruit the skill positions. Other than that, his defenses are always elite. His line play is always elite. And this year, I think he's got weapons all over the place on offense. So we'll see. But yeah, I I tend to agree with you. Uh, UW fan, Jim, the old saying, it takes money to make money. Yes, it does. Yes, it does. Tanner Plumer, I think BYU's brand is strong enough for them to get in uh, to the Super League. BYU is in the Super League. 100%. There's not a Super League with it. The the one university I'm curious about is Cincinnati. How much wherewithal does Cincinnati have financially? And I think it's probably significant. I think it's probably significant. Um, I don't worry about UCF. I don't worry if the people that run UCF are brilliant people. Those are, there's good people on both sides at UCF. I'm going to move on. Uh, San Diego state, Glenn, don't count me in that San Diego state number, Monty. Okay. Glenn, let's have the conversation. Does San Diego state annually spend a hundred million dollars or more on, on their football program? I don't know the answer to that. I don't see how they do that. Well, and I think the super league puts you in a position where if you don't know the answer is no. Like, I think it's a proposition where you got to be okay spending that kind of money on a regular basis. This isn't like a one-time payment thing. I know San Diego State well. 
I understand the ecosystem of education in, in California. It's a rough road to hoe right now. Things are turning up. There's no question about that. With mortgage rates coming down, and if the Fed cuts the rate in September, certainly I think we all would agree life in California is going to get a hell of a lot easier. That does not impact the UC system. And where we are with education at the state level in California and really across the country, I don't know that th- that money's ever going to be there. And I'm curious if they if they get there. Uh, Glass City Buck, BYU got that uh, long money, Tanner. Yes, they do. Yes, they do. Justin Bemis, good morning. Um, it's funny to me, Utah hasn't even played a conference game. Oh, boy, is this going to be a shot at the Big 12 by an exiting Texas fan? You guys might want to – hey, uh, Justin, do you play running back? <coughs> Asking for a friend. Bro. Uh, and they and they have not become – they have now become the new Texas and Oklahoma. Got to love Big 12 fans and their hate. Well, there listen, is no I, love loss there. I, I think that, uh, again, I think what Big 12 fan, like diehard Big 12 fan who was here before Utah was here doesn't want to say – is that Utah's got a special mix this year because there's actually someone sitting behind Cam Rising who can play, and obviously Cam's eligibility is finally going to run out, and he knows he has to get the job done this year. So if you're Kyle Whittingham and you're looking at your roster, you're saying, yeah, this is probably the best chance I have to make a run, a deeper run into the college football playoff. Uh, We might want to get it right this year. And by the way, it's our first year in the Big 12. So we might want to get it right this year. And that's why I think Utah is, is you know, a, a comfortable pick to win the Big 12. And that's why I think Big 12 fan is so insecure when Kyle Winningham talks because they know what it is. Yeah, Like, they know what it is. Yep, I totally agree. I think it, you better embrace the fact that Utah is a legitimate college football playoff contender. Legit. And I think, again, I took... Oklahoma State fan, I get it. I get it. You guys like DUIs. I totally understand it. <laughs> you get so pissed when I say, I think Kansas is better than Oak State. I think... Well, Monty, we play defense in Stillwater. What are you talking about? I, I, well, I, I don't think I've ever said that Oklahoma State doesn't play defense. You're not on par with Utah. Yeah. And I think I look at, I look at what... Oak State is a cut below Utah right now. We're going to find out on the field. They play each other this year. It's as simple as that. Do you guys understand that I am missing a golf opportunity because of Utah and Oak State? I hope you guys understand that. I could go and play golf with Smiley Kaufman. I'm not going to do that because I need, I'm here for, I am here for you. We're here for your dumb ass. I don't know what this we stuff is. I don't know what this we stuff is. I am here for your dumbass takes on your Oklahoma State Cowboy DUIs. I'm here for it, right? I'm here yeah. when when Oak State James says that Ollie Gordon got a DUI. Yeah, I better start running stairs. That's his punishment. Okay, okay, that's fine. I'm here for that. I, I'm happy to laugh in your face about those things. I truly am. <laughs> if Oak State and Utah were on any other weekend, I'd be off that Friday playing golf with Smiley Kaufman in Half Moon Bay, California. But I'm not. And you hyenas better hit the tip jar and thank me I want to thank me for having no days off. Uh, Shout out to Stage Koala. (laughs) I'm speeding because I have to poop. Okay. (laughs) We take all comers here as long as you're paying. Uh, Welcome to the membership. Appreciate you. You guys hit the join button for $1.99 a month. Um, You can get all of your comments highlighted in red. You know, we overwhelmingly read member comments. I'll occasionally read non-member comments, depending on what level of red ass you are. If you're Sharice or Glenn from San Diego State, I'm probably going to read your comments. You know, if you're anybody else, I'm probably not. I want the best People for ten ninety nine, you or nine ninety nine for ten dollars, you can get into our members only content on Instagram, curated by Jake right there. Hit join, send Jake a DM on Instagram, he'll add you to our members only group. Um, let's see, uh, Sean Rollins, Oak State James, correct. 
<laughs> Correct, man. Oak State James, you know. Uh, the Chad Carter, who has water again. Cincinnati will be fine. If this was 20 years ago, probably not. But they have taken several steps forward even before joining the Big 12. I agree. I agree. Noel Ramirez, uh, you just not know. Hello? I don't read. You just know Kyle Whittingham loves the song Marvin's Room by Drake. Huh? What Marvin's Room is a good tune. Especially the verse, I think I'm addicted to naked pictures. Wah, wah, and sitting about bitches that we almost had. <laughs> <laughs> I know I sit, I, quote, uh, I'm sitting talking about bitches we almost had. I know I do that regularly. <laughs> On your Harley. You know, without sleeves. Yeah. Which which is fine. Uh, San Diego State, Glenn, let's see how uh, Snapdragon revenue plays into it. We'll see. Right. We'll see. Tanner Plummer, speaking of Siriana, you guys know he's basically a lame duck coach. Fuck off. Oh, my God. All the way off. Dude. All the way Bro. off. Oh, Nick Siriani's a god. I love him so much. <laughs> I want to lick the tears off of his chin. Who is he? Preston Stone? Oh, my God. The only one I want to slurp more is Donovan McNabb after he vomits in his face mask. I his love guy. Nick Siriani. That's my guy. He shouldn't have been fired, Monty. Don't you talk about him like that. Monty, look at him, look at him on the golf cart now, with Jalen. Now he's a lame duck coach. Well, who, who are you, Mike McCarthy? God, Philadelphia fans, you're just... <sighs> Jeremy Severe. Honestly, if Coach is talking about expansion, uh, I think he is repeating stuff he hears in meetings with Brent Yormark. I don't know who Brent Yormark yeah, is, but... Brent... <laughs> You know, um, <laughs> is Brent different than Brett Venables? I'm a terrible person. <laughs> Brent is different than Brant while we're talking about Kyle Whittingham. Or Bob. Go, Bob. Uh, James, Monty's logic is good. Except those in the Super League will get more money. The smaller teams that make it will be fine. Okay, so let me ask you. It's, 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 it's. It's not that you're getting more money, James, and everybody else who says this. Uh, Boise State. Boise State has significant infrastructure debt now. So let me ask you about Boise State. Boise State will lay out a minimum of $100 million on football alone. And you're telling me if they get, because I think you're probably looking at the Garden Variety team. It's funny, I had this conversation late last week. In a Super League, what's the average garden variety team get? Probably 70 to $80 million. And then if you go to the postseason, you're going to get a bump for every game that you play. And you'll get a bonus for TV ratings. So forth and so on. There will be a bonus structure. Right. The real money in the Super League is not the TV money. It's the win games money in the postseason, and it is your ability to drive new sponsorship money through your facilities, through your programs, through... So if you're Utah, a prolific, prolific fundraising institution, Eccles is on every building, including the football stadium. Right. Do you have, you haven't put a jersey patch on yet. That's coming. You have like all of the, like there's, they, do you understand the sales operation at the University of Utah? You think that's the same thing up in Boise? It's not. It's not. That's a small market where they rely on companies, regional companies and brands to support them. So you really think that you can compete if you're Syracuse, if you're UConn? And again, I'll ask you, does San Diego State go back to Snapdragon and say, yeah, we're going to need more money when they don't win football games at a high level? Basketball, different story. When they don't win football games at a high level. That's going to be tough. It's not that you're making more TV money. 
The bulk of the money is going to be self-generated. TV money will go up in, again, and let's say that the guys that I'm talking to about this are right. It's $70, $80 million as a baseline. Huge raise for San Diego State. Huge raise for Boise State. Can they afford the infrastructure of 100 scholarships? Can they afford the infrastructure of feeding, housing, medically caring for, providing insurance, and lifetime medical uh, benefits for injuries? Can they afford the infrastructure that goes with the staffing up of the football program, the staffing up of the athletic uh, the athletic program, the oversight of the collectives that you will have to build and fund? Because there's a lot of people who believe schools are going to seed fund collectives to help them make more money. You guys are, you're looking at this as a TV contract. It's not a TV contract. And I will continue to say, understand that if your annual revenue from TV and, and games played and all of that is 70 to $80 million, that's not nearly enough. You'll need to, you'll need to make three times that in extra revenue that you bring in on your own, where you have now the sales and branding staff, a brand new department of like the big 12 created a commercial department for football and a commercial department for basketball. You will have to do the exact same thing. You got that kind of coin. You got that kind of, you, you're going to invest in dozens of new employees, put them on salary, put them on benefits. You got that kind of coin. By the way, none of these people are going to expand their stadiums. So you're not selling more tickets because if you're in the Super League, here's the other truth, UCLA football. You think more people are going to come and watch shitty football at the Rose Bowl this year because they're in the Big Ten now? They might see an uptick for visiting fans. But you're not going to see some massive influx of UCLA football fan buying tickets and selling out the Rose Bowl because they don't win games. And until that changes, Cal Berkeley, who's still under the weight of Memorial Stadium, do you really think Cal Berkeley fans going to show up? And my God, we're, we're in the ACC now. Here comes, here comes Georgia Tech. We better get our tickets. Come on now. Come on now. A, 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 be realistic, man. Be realistic. Well, and, and I think you you look at other, you know, obviously SC fan is riding high, right? Like USC is going to do very well in, in ticket sales this year because their matchups have improved. You're obviously, like you said, you're going to get that influx of road fans when, you know, you have that big time, big 10 matchup, you know, and by the way, I can't wait. Just generally speaking, I cannot wait for Big Ten after dark this year. I can't wait for big that Ten big Saturday time. night. Yeah, can't wait for that, dude. I, I'm about that this year. D's nuts. Okay, see, this better be good. Again, this is what I tell you every time. If your name is D's nuts and you're paying ten dollars, don't waste it. BYU says their D line has improved stopping the run in practice. But this is the same D-line that gave up an average 180 yards a game against an O-line that was probably the worst in the Big 12. Well, again, Deion Sanders, um, let me explain to you that Jay Hill and that defensive staff, and Kalani Sataki is a big part of it, obviously, their, just their, their development on the D-line, but also their linebackers, and the fact that you're losing a guy like Max Tooley, who's balling out, by the way, for the Houston Texans, um, you medically retired Ben Bywater, which sucks. Yes. But you have depth and quality, and you're faster at the linebacker position, and your safeties are playing downhill. Their run, their run defense will be significantly better this year because they're deeper and they're more talented. A lot of people believe that D-line stopped the run. Nothing could be further from the truth. Are they critical to stopping the run? Of course they are. But you look at the best run defenses in the country. They have great linebacker play. Yeah. They have great linebacker play. Disciplined they have, linebacker play. Well, and disciplined defensive end play. Yeah. Disciplined, like, gap integrity 
is a huge part. Like, it's not enough to be talented on the D-line. We saw this with Michigan last year. It's not that Michigan was talented. They were well-coached and disciplined. Yeah, you never had a time at Michigan last year where your your defensive end allowed the 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 edge to get you know to be to not or to that not your that your 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 D tackles depending on what technique they're playing but your D tackles are just giving up their gap in freelancing yeah it that's not how you win football games the difference at BYU this year is you're more well coached it's year two of Jay Hill system and you have better depth than you have had in some time. And, and I also think that that's where appreciating what a good offensive line can do for you gets lost on a lot of college football fans. Like the defensive line understands what they need to do to, to slow the rundown, right? Yeah. They, they understand, totally Hey, like we got to feed the back to our linebackers. And if we do that, you know, we're, we're, we're going to hold these guys to one, two yards carry. But, but if, if the offensive line is able to move guys and open up gaps, that's when you get in trouble because the back, has more space to operate against a linebacker. And most, unless you're Texas this year, most college football teams have pretty damn good talent in the running back room that's going to beat a linebacker one-on-one. You, you have to have that to be successful. Yeah, and I, I think when you look at, when you look at, BYU is an interesting example here because if Jerry with a G wins that job, I think it's very bad for BYU. I think that... Jake Retzloff is the prototypical winner at college football. His skill set, his size, his ability to run, his ability to pass, which is set up by his ability to, to be mobile outside the pocket. All of those things are critical. His chemistry with the offensive line, I think you got to keep LJ Martin healthy. I think that goes without saying. But Jerry Bohannon has for long stretches look like the better quarterback at camp. But I think Jake Retzloff has also closed that gap significantly. And if we do get a decision that, that tomorrow or Saturday, I would be very disappointed if it was not Jake Retzloff. Because I, I look at a guy that is, I look at a guy that is ready to run this team for two years. That's Jake Retzloff. Jerry Bohannon's never going to play another college football game after this season. And I think we know who he is. And the argument, BYU fan, that somehow, well, Jake was terrible last year. How Who could have been good in that system last year? Who could have been good? When you look at the turnover on the offensive line, you look at the injuries they they seeming, seemingly have every year on that on that offense, you look at your best receiver pretty much playing like three snaps, Cody Epps, not playing a lot of the year, like, and his inexperience, and yet he still had them in position to win games down the stretch. Yeah, that's the thing I think you you take away from last year is even with the criticism of the defense, even with the offensive woes, you, I mean, you're still – you know, you're, you're still pushing Arkansas at their place to the limit, bro. Like you're, 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 you're in, like they were in a ton of these games last year. Now they had some games that they lost that I don't think even last year they should have lost, but you were in pretty much every game. And, and that's where I say, Hey, like at what point do we depart from the idea of, Hey, we're going to have yeah. our quarterback be here one season. Then he's going on to the league. Like when do we get to have, you know, a guy be here at least two years, be the guy, put the quarterback conversation to bed so we can focus on, you know, a better offensive line player. We can focus on this or that. Like, that's what the great college football teams don't have to deal with. Ohio State doesn't have to deal with that, right? Like, Texas doesn't have to deal with that. You know, you, you Utah's not dealing with it. Yet, here we are. And you want to have your OC constantly talking about, oh, well, we're going to let the team decide. Well, I'm not a big fan of that philosophy. It shouldn't be we're going to let the team decide. Well, I don't, I don't, I think what he's saying is it will, and I agree with A-Rod and Kalani on this. It will, the, the, the race will win itself. One of these two quarterbacks will outperform the other. And at long stretches, it's been Bohannon. But I think you've seen more than enough from Jake Retzloff to understand that he's your guy. If he continues to get beat in in the daily, I mean, I think we all knew that 
if you looked at this team closely at all at BYU, you knew that Jaron Hall was the best quarterback in camp. You knew that. I don't think you have that feeling. There isn't enough separation between Bohannon and Retzloff at this moment. There isn't. San Diego State, Glenn, Snapdragon is owned by San Diego State, Monty. Sure. But it's a $400 million project on the surface because what was it? $300 million to build it, $90 million to buy it. Because then they buy the land. San Diego State bought the land uh, that the San Diego County Credit Union Stadium was built on, right? Like, so you paid ninety million for that land. It was three hundred million to, to build it, and then you had all overruns. It's like a four hundred million dollar project, and it only seats thirty five thousand people. Yeah. So when we talk about Snapdragon, you have debt load on that. You have a really good partner on it with Snapdragon, but you you have a situation when I talk about football. 35,000 seats for a Super League caliber program is tiny. That's a corner at Bryant-Denny Stadium. And then on top of that, and they've done a great job. I I think it needs to be said. They've done a great job with, they've had a ton of soccer there. They've had lacrosse there, rugby there. Like they put a lot of really good events in there. 35,000 seats is a baseball stadium. It's not a football stadium. Right. And I think that will be a great example of San Diego State doesn't have the self-generated revenue, in my opinion, to compete at that level. You, I mean, it, it, it just, I don't know what, what is, um, if, if you look at Rice Eccles, right? And Rice Eccles Stadium, I think seats, it's like 50, where is it? It's like 50 something, 52,000. 51,444 after the expansion in 2021. You're talking about 15, 16,000 more seats. I mean, that's 50% more seats, man. That's a that's a lot of ticket revenue. Uh Big Blue Horses, is there is there a more annoying and uh diluted fan base than Boise State? Well, uh maybe Oak State or Penn, Penn State fan. Yeah. Hmm. Austin Davis. Hello. Austin Davis is the new member of the show. Uh, I forgot to change my name back. I, I'm excited to see what Utah can do in the Big 12. Me too. I truly am. I cannot wait for Oak State, Utah. I think that's one of the biggest games of the year. I'm going to fire up the smoker. I am going to figure, I'm going to, I am going to, at my house, I am going to have a TV outside. I don't know how I'm going to do it. I'm not sure. Maybe I'll try to find, Mrs. Monty doesn't let me spend money anymore. Um, but I am going to find a roller stand, like one of those. Whoa, you're you're going to join the frame. roller crew? Shut up. I'm going to get one of those roller stands for a TV outside. I have a, I have a hot tub. I have really nice patio furniture. I have a full golf set up in my backyard. Yeah. I have a Traeger. I am going to, I'm doing it. I don't. I don't give a rat's ass. I'm doing it because fall football is amazing. And Oak State, Utah, there are some games this year. Oregon, Ohio State, massive game. Massive game. Game of the year Fired up. all over it. What's your thought on Isaac Wilson as the backup quarterback at Utah? I think that's what you needed, isn't it? Is, isn't it, Austin? I mean, if he doesn't win that backup job, my biggest concern, and uh, again, I understand I've sat here and filleted Kyle Whittingham for years on end, but his biggest Achilles heel has been the quarterback position. Yeah, well, he came up, he came out, I think, Monday and said, it might have been Tuesday, and said that Isaac had, you know, secured it currently. So I, I, he I earned I, it. Yeah, I, I don't I, look, I, I think Isaac Wilson is somebody. Much like the much like the BYU Retzloff thing, uh, Utah needs another guy to come in and be there for several years. And and I think yes. that that Isaac Wilson, the the cool thing with this kid is he does have the bravado, but he's incredibly like incredibly athletic. And that's one thing with Cam Rising that he wasn't gifted with. I I don't think that Cam is. You're never going to see Cam out here trying to compete for the fastest forty yard dash time. That said, he can he's fast enough to get the job done. So when I look yes. at Utah 
and I look at the Big 12 and I say, okay, let's let's presume Utah wins the Big 12 this year. Cam and the fellas move on to the NFL. Okay, great. You gotta, you know, you gotta reload. Okay, well, you're in a really strong position now. And presuming that Isaac Wilson sees the field, you know, let's say five games this year, maybe. Dude. Just, like that's that's gonna be helpful. He needs that development. And and yes, if I'm if I'm Kyle Whittingham, if I get ahead on on one of these teams, if I'm up 25 in the fourth quarter, I'm putting Isaac Wilson in the game. I I, I want Cam Rising and Brand Keithy to be healthy the entire season. Yeah, every rep. And I do think part of that is 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 taking care of them and understanding. Hey, like if these two dudes are healthy, we're 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 college football playoff good. We're we're uh, compete at the top of college football good because of the defense. So if we can just keep these two guys healthy, we're we got a shot. And that's I'm telling you, you're going to see load management come into play if they can get out in front of some of these these softer teams that that they will see on the schedule at certain points. Yeah, I, I think it'll be very interesting to see what, and look at that, Ross Dellinger. Next week in Dallas, commissioners from the group of five will gather to discuss pressing issues, including a reshaped G5 postseason incorporating the Bulls. It's not rocket science. I can only sit here and tell you I wear a size 15 shoe. Yeah. I know things. I just know things. I'm telling you, the G5 does not want the Super League. And well, they, they can't absorb it. They, 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 it's not like I agree they don't want it, but it's not possible for them to do it financially. And I think there's very few situations. What Glenn and I are talking about with Snapdragon or Albertsons in, in Boise, like I think. I think if everything broke perfectly, Boise State would be right on that line of, well, we won't lose so much money that we can't afford to do it. But there's just not the infrastructure in place to be like, oh, it's a cash cow for us. We have to do it. Is it worth it for Boise State as a as an institution to force their way, force it financially to get into the to the Super League just to lose pretty much every game? Because that's what you're talking about. You need to understand that. If if schools like Boise mm -hmm. State are going to try and jump into the Super League, you're talking about playing uh, a very uh, a team that is better than you every single week. Yeah. So what's that going to do? Well, that's going to drive that's going to drive your ticket sales down. That's not. But it's an like interesting point, though. Will they recruit up? Will they be able to recruit up? And I don't think they will. You don't have like San Diego State. There's no better place to be a college student than San Diego. Seriously, it's not just Wales vagina friends. Like it is. That's a great place to go to college. The weather's good. The chicks are amazing. The food's amazing. The view's amazing. The beach is amazing. LA's right up the road. Like, it's amazing. But that that that's not the case in Boise. I'm telling you, if you've never been to Boise, it's in the middle of nowhere, bruh. Like, it is... There's not a lot going on. Yeah, you just kind of are driving down the road and Boise just kind of shows up and you're through that town in what, 10 minutes? I'm minutes, what maybe? I'm what I'm what I'm pointing at is it's a small market. It's not it's not like you're going to have access to the best players in the country. It's just really difficult. And you don't play basketball at a high level, in my opinion, consistently. And again, I can go back to, I've talked about it on this show for years now. College basketball revenue is vitally important. It is, I think, especially now in the Big 12 model, which I think is the model for business in college basketball, it's got to be a revenue generator on a big scale. It's, it's no longer an afterthought. Utah's a great example of this. The running Utes have to get back to the business of winning basketball games. BYU basketball has to get back to winning basketball games. San Diego State is already winning basketball games at a very high level. They've got tournament shares for years now. Look at Houston. Look at like you look at the 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 infrastructure of basketball that is in and around the Big 12 and I am telling you it is the reason this this conference can compete. Because they're making, they're making big, fundamental, foundational changes in the way they do business. And basketball is a huge part of that. Uh, let's see. 
who else? Uh, Tanner Plummer. BYU is just setting themselves up for embarrassment when they talk that way. They need to show it on the field. Narratives don't win games. No, they don't. Uh, Sharice. Jim Harbaugh is the biggest liar and cheater I've ever seen. Go box. <laughs> All right, Monty. Jimmy's coming back to the big house. He's going to be our captain for a game. And we're gonna we're gonna buy him cheeseburgers. I love how that flew under the radar, dude. That what he's he, no longer what, coming back. What do you mean he's not coming? Oh, so you mean to tell me that he's gonna use the Chargers as an excuse not to show his face at the stadium? But he's okay. our guy. Yeah. It, it, Monty, That's them, bullshit. Those kids were hungry, bro. He just bought him a cheeseburger, dude. Yeah. Okay. They gotta eat. Okay. <laughs> Trust me, they ate. Scott of Greywater Watch. Monty, would your show make the Super League of Sports podcast? I don't know. We don't do a podcast. You're not as big as Bill Simmons, Dan Levitard, Dan Patrick McAfee. Okay. I'm not saying that I am. I'm the G5 of shows. Great. I don't give a... Yeah, I don't. I don't. Yeah. You know. Michigan was uh, extremely well coached, but they did have something like 13 players drafted, right? And they also had signs. 